Good morning, everyone. Welcome to ICANX, Connecting the World and the Universe. Today, I'm your host, Professor Martin Thuo from North Carolina State University. This month, we conclude uh, the month of July with our speaker, Rebecca uh, Kramer Butiglio from Yale University, following the talks by Ruizi uh, Mazan and uh, Francesco Starashi and the Africa Day speakers uh, early in the month. Today, I'll be joined with, uh, by three panelists, uh, Dr. Lavi Tutika from Virginia Tech and Professor Josh uh, Bogard from the uh, University of Vermont. And our challenger today is going to be Bo Yuan from Tsinghua University. Our speaker today is Professor Rebecca Kramer Botiglia from Yale University. She's not new to the world of liquid metals, uh, having uh, done ex excellent work in the area of fabrication uh, using liquid metal and manufacturing using uh, liquid metal for to make soft robot uh, and flexible electronics. Uh, uh, Professor Rebecca is very, very well uh, honored, uh, having won almost every Ari Career Award in the U.S., starting from NSF uh, to uh, the uh, ONR and among others. She's also the recipient of the PACASA Award, the highest honor for Ari uh, Career Investigators. She has also gathered many, many uh, awards that I'm, I'm not going to spend all the time going through uh, for the sake of time. Uh, but I, I want to highlight that she's, she's, she was named as a, a Forbes 30 under 30 for her work on manufacturing using liquid metals. Uh, she also serves uh, in, in, in many um, scientific endeavors, including uh, editorial uh, boards. And uh, without further ado, I want to invite our speaker today uh, to take uh, the reins. Rebecca? Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. Can you confirm that you can see my slides? Yep. And hear yeah, me okay? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Great. Okay. So thank you again for the introduction. Thank you, Martin and Alice, for inviting me to speak as part of this really exciting series. Um, I'm very excited to, to share some of my work with such a broad audience today all over the world. So. Today, I'm going to talk about my group's work on shape-changing soft robots capable of adapting to changing tasks and environments. But first, I want to start with the robot cliche. So when you ask people to conjure up an image of a robot, usually they think of something like this. These are automotive manufacturing robots. They're rigid machines that perform repeated tasks. They're incredibly good at what they're designed to do, right? So these are fast and strong and precise. But what they are not is safe for human robot interaction. You don't see any humans on the floor with these robots. Um, and they're not adaptable. So you don't see these robots changing, adapting to changing tasks and environments because that's not what they've been designed to do. But when we all imagine robots for the future, I think we all imagine something more like this, like animals, like ourselves. We are incredibly adaptable. We readily adapt our body configuration and our behavior to changing tasks and environments. And we even adapt our body properties. So, you know, we adapt our body's stiffness to perform both gentle and forceful tasks. So how do we do that? And how do we make robots do that? Well, I noticed something when watching all of these videos. All of these animals look at least partially soft. So we can take a deeper dive into that observation. Okay, so here are here's a plot of all the known animals in the world, just over a million at the time of this data. And as it turns out, yes, all known animals in the world are at least partially soft. There are no known animals that are completely rigid, which is in contrast to the way that we typically design machines and robots. And if we look at this even further, we see that more than half of all animals in the world are completely soft. So Completely soft animals need to be supported by their environments. You can think of things like jellyfish that live in the water and worms that live in the ground. We as humans are a fairly large animal that lives on the ground, and so we require our skeletal structure to keep us standing up. But even so, humans are only about 15% bone and 85% soft and fluid materials. So this got me thinking, is it possible that our soft material composition plays a role in our ability to interact with and adapt to our environment? And if so, can soft robotic technologies be part of the solution to the adaptability problem? 
So I am by no means the first or the only person to make these observations and ask these questions. Soft robotics is a rapidly growing field and there are many potential benefits to soft robots. So here are just a few soft robots that I believe showcase these benefits very well. The first is a locomotion robot that you can see in the video. This robot uh, is locomoting out into the street where it gets run over by a car and is able to continue locomotion despite this impact. Uh, so this demonstrates the resilience of soft robots and their robustness to impact. In the middle, you can see an image of a soft pneumatic gripper, which is able to grasp diverse and delicate objects due to the soft material conforming around those objects. And on the right, you can see a wearable robot, which is uh, used to increase the efficiency of the wearer's motions or augment load capacity without restricting the natural mechanics of motion of the wearer. However, all of these robots, uh, however awesome, are also task specific. They don't lend well to any other task outside their intended use case. So, for example, the locomotion robot would not perform well in a manipulation or wearable context, and the wearable system shown here would not function as a locomotion robot or a gripper, and so on. So, the question is this, or my question, uh, is there a more flexible design approach to soft robots? Can we develop hardware platforms that adapt their body morphology, properties, and behavioral control policies to changing tasks and environments the way we do? So this is a question that I would like to focus on today, and really it's the question that motivates the work of my group. So the specific angle that my lab takes toward answering this question is to develop new multifunctional materials and infuse them into soft robot platforms in order to achieve some of these new behaviors, such as adaptive morphology. And one of our core competencies is to leverage emulsification to discretize bulk responsive materials to make them compatible with different manufacturing processes or mix them into other responsive materials in order to achieve multifunctional composites, and then again, porting them into some new soft robot platforms with the goal of achieving adaptive shape behavior pairings. So some of these soft robot platforms, which you can see on the right, include stretchable electronics, which is really more of a robot component than a platform, but also uh, robotic skins and robotic fabrics and legged robots with morphing limbs. So today, I'm going to focus on three of these topics, stretchable electronics, robotic fabrics, and morphing robots. Okay, so let's kick off with stretchable electronics. So first, let me start by noting that soft robots operationally rely on material deformation and elasticity. So naturally, the components of soft robots, including their sensors and electronics, should be similarly soft and elastic. There are a number of different approaches to stretchable electronics, including patterns of waves and serpentines in thin metallic films and conductive composites. But for the remainder of this topic, I'm going to talk about liquid metals. So liquid metals are exactly what they sound like. They're metals that are liquid at room temperature. That means they have metallic conductivity, but can stretch and deform like liquids, which could be very advantageous for stretchable resistive and capacitive sensors for soft robot proprioception, as well as stretchable electronics that could be built into the bodies of soft robots without limiting their motions. So liquid metal sensors and electronics are conceptually really straightforward. For example, this schematic is meant to show a liquid metal filling a microchannel that's embedded in a soft elastomer sheet. By straining, pressing, or bending the sheet, the cross-sectional area of the underlying microchannel changes, which changes the resistance across that channel, and we can map the change in resistance to the deformation. This basic principle, this basic principle could uh, apply to any conductive liquid, but liquid metals are truly exceptional and fascinating. So now when I refer to liquid metal, I'm referring specifically to eutectic gallium indium, or E-gain for short, which is about 75% gallium and 25% indium by weight. E-gain has high electrical conductivity, a low melting temperature of about 15 degrees Celsius, low viscosity, low toxicity, near zero vapor pressure, and fluid properties. One of the most unique properties of gallium-based liquid metals is that their surfaces rapidly react with oxygen in the environment to form a thin passivating oxide skin, which is about one to three nanometers thick and primarily composed of gallium oxide. So the surface oxide formation enables outcomes such as this, the ability to direct right liquid metal microcomponents at room temperature, as shown in this video, which is the work of Michael Dickey's group at NC State. This thin oxide skin that forms rapidly on the surface of liquid metal stabilizes the microstructures despite the low viscosity and large surface en energy of the liquid. So we can make sensors using liquid metal. So you can see here a soft multimodal sensor where liquid metal sensors are used to reconstruct applied strains and pressures to the soft skin-like device. 
And in this video, you can see how this device was made by injecting liquid metal into pre-made microchannels in this elastomer sheet. So this seems to be working really well. However, the vast majority of the time when I was making these types of devices, it did not work as well. There are notable challenges associated with fabricating these types of devices with liquid metal. The same surface oxide formation that is so unique to gallium-based liquid metals and enables those freestanding liquid metal structures that you saw in the prior slide also introduces these fabrication challenges. Namely, the combination of E-gain e surface tension, density, and viscosity make it difficult to print at small scales without some modification. So this image on the right shows a failed fabrication attempt. This is my own image from graduate school where I found my own device yield using this fabrication technique was about 10%, which is pretty low. So when starting my own faculty career, this is a problem I was really motivated to work on. And here is the solution that we came up with. Using an emulsion process, we could break bulk E-gain into small E-gain particles that are suspended in a carrier solvent. So in this image, the carrier solvent is ethanol, but many solvents could be used. And the formation of gallium oxide around each of the particles prevents spontaneous coalescence and stabilizes the emulsion. So now we can print liquid metal emulsions using the properties of the carrier solvent, which will evaporate away after deposition and leave behind the liquid metal particles. And this worked. So here you can see inkjet printing of liquid metal particles onto a nitrile glove. And in this case, we're printing strain sensors along the fingers and contact pads near the wrist. So taking a closer look at the printed film, if we zoom way in on this nitrile glove, you can see the liquid liquid metal particles on the surface where the carrier solvent, the ethanol, has evaporated away after deposition. But this printed film is not conductive as printed. There's just too many electrical losses between the contacts in this very polydispersed film. Just like printing other conductive particles, the particles need to be sintered after printing. However, unlike other conductive particles, we don't need to melt these particles to sinter them. They're already liquid. Rather, we can mechanically sinter the particles. So the particles are like water balloons with liquid metal on the inside and the gallium oxide is like the balloon. And we can apply mechanical pressure just pressing on the surface. It pops those water balloons, these uh, liquid metal balloons, if you will, uh, pops the underlying particles, the liquid metal cores flow out, uh, they coalesce, and they leave behind a conductive trace. So here we just were able to drag a tip, uh, just apply that pressure, and create this liquid metal conductive trace. So we next sought to automate and scale the printing and sintering process. So here we spray printed the liquid metal particles and laser sintered the conductive patterns, which works by thermally shocking the particles, such as their cores expand rapidly and fracture the gallium oxide shells, therefore allowing the liquid cores to spill out and sinter the particles. Compared to mechanical sintering, laser sintering can generate complex patterns in a lot less time and also enables multi-layer circuits by controlling the sintering depth. And also using a laser with a small spot size enables very small traces at high densities. Importantly, this sensor fabrication process increased our device yield to over 90%. So as I just noted, we previously found that the laser sintering of liquid metal particles is a thermal process uh, achieved through rupture of the oxide shells um, due to the thermal expansion of the liquid cores relative to those oxide shells. Um, so based on this mechanism, we were really interested in the possibility of thermal sintering simply by putting liquid metal particle films into a high temperature environment. And this is what we found. We found that by thermally treating particle films, the E-gain particles are transformed into a thin solid film on top, which is about 500 nanometers thick and invariant with respect to the total film thickness, and a thick biphasic portion with solid particles embedded in liquid E-gain. So during heating, the particles at the top surface become gallium indium crystalline solids due to oxidation and phase segregation. They create these beautiful nanowires that you can see on the surface. Um, and, and then this dense oxide layer largely prevents further oxygen penetration into the particles that lie deeper in the film. Meanwhile, the liquid particles underneath the solid layer experience this thermal shock, the significant internal thermal stresses owing to the larger thermal expansion of the liquid cores relative to the oxide shells. So they rupture and coalesce the particles, sintering the particles below the film. And then on the right is what you can see. We just flipped over the entire film so that solid shell on the top has broken into larger particles and it's covered by a liquid film on top. So the resulting biphasic comp composition, which I'll refer to as biphasic gallium indium or B-gain, has this very unique strain insensitive behavior. 
Vegan is also printable, has high conductivity, can stretch to over 1,000%, shows consistent performance over 1,500 strain cycles, and reliably interfaces with rigid electronics. And in the plots, you can see that we use Vegan in several different circuits, including circuits with a single ohm resistor, which is also what you can see in the video on top, um, and one with an electrical via, all demonstrating relatively low changes in resistance as a function of strain when compared to E-gain and bulk conductor assumptions. So unlike E-gain, which shows immense promise in sensing applications due to its high strain sensitivity, B-gain has a relatively low uh, sensitivity. Its relative strain insensitivity makes it more applicable to soft circuit applications. So as one example, we made a stretchable amplifier circuit. So we input a sinusoidal voltage signal into the circuit and measured output signals after, ampli after amplification when the amplifier circuit is at 0% and 400% strain. So we tested the same circuit built with copper traces as a control. And in the data shown here, you can see that the B-gain amplifier circuit works the same regardless of applied strain. We also made a multi-layer signal conditioning circuit with integrated sensing and computation for wearable sensing applications. So typically, uh, we would use stretch capacitive sensors with a co-located rigid signal conditioning circuit board for capacitive capacitance measurement, um, which is shown in the bottom right. And this moderately constrains the movement of the body. So we rebuilt the circuit using B-gain on VHB tape, integrating a microcontroller, a capacitor, and five resistors, which allowed us to co-locate the circuit and the sensor directly over the user's elbow, the point of highest strain. And this indicates a step toward unobtrusive wearable electronics. And in this video, we're showing a stretchable LED display undergoing strain with no perceptible diminishing of the LED brightness. We believe the compatibility of B-Gain with scalable manufacturing methods, its ability to interface with off-the-shelf electronic components, and its electrical and mechanical stability will enable direct conversion of established circuit board assemblies to soft and stretchable forms. So, to further emphasize this point, I'm really excited to share some unpublished work today on what we believe to be the first stretchable single board computer and its integration into a soft robot. All robots require the ability to carry out decision-making computations. However, soft robots stretch and therefore need a solution other than rigid computers. Using B-Gain, we recently created the first stretchable single board computer, a soft stretchable Arduino. So we embedded this highly stretchable Arduino, which can strain to over 300%, the single board computer into the body of a soft quadruped, building in computation that is not limited by rigidity, tethers, or low logic gate density, and making computational use of what would otherwise be inert structural material. Okay, so I'm now going to completely switch gears and move into another portion of the talk on robotic fabrics. Fabrics are key materials for a variety of applications that require flexibility, breathability, a small storage footprint, and low weight. While fabrics have conventionally been passive materials with static properties, recent progress in active fibers with actuation, sensing, and variable stiffness capabilities present the opportunity to impart robotic function into fabrics. So in this part of my talk, I'm going to describe the functional fibers that we have developed in order to roboticize everyday fabrics as a platform for reconfigurable robots. So we have developed three functional fibers for robotic fabrics. The first is for actuation, and here we employ night null shape memory alloy wire. One challenge we encountered when integrating antagonistic wire bending actuators into fabric is that any off-center forces encourage the wire to twist in the fabric rather than purely bend. So this contortion can introduce chaotic actuation or even bending in the opposite of the intended direction if the wire turns over within its couching, which is what we use to attach the SMA wire to the fabric. We overcame this challenge by flattening the round SMA wires into ribbons, as shown here, to achieve controlled fabric bending. For the purpose of sensing, we developed a pickering emulsion of PDMS particles coated in par carbon black particles and suspended in ethanol solvent. The pickering emulsion is printable and results in deposition of conductive composite on individual fabric fibers, creating resistive strain sensors suitable for state estimation and closed loop control while maintaining the fiber architecture of the fabric. So I'm going to go into a bit more detail on this pickering emulsion. The pickering emulsion-based sensors are unique due to their non-toxic fabrication process. 
Typically, conductive composites need to be thinned with a compatible solvent, such as cyclohexane, which is a very toxic solvent in order to be printable. Here, rather than thinning the precure polymer, we instead suspend it in a carrier solvent, similar to our liquid metal particles in the prior section. And because we're using the solvent only as a carrier solvent, we can use a non-toxic option, such as ethanol. Upon deposition, the ethanol evaporates away, and the precure polymer particles destabilize and spread, mixing with the conductive particles as they spread to form a conductive composite film. So this self-coagulates into a conductive composite. And on the bottom left, you can see confirmation of the Pickering emulsion with the solid carbon black particles stabilizing at the polymer particle interface. And in these middle bottom images, you can see the just deposited Pickering emulsion, and then the polymer starting to flow out and mix with the carbon black particles. Finally, on the bottom right, you can see a cured film where the small solid particles cause cracks in the film, like mud cracks, which is what yields the sensing mechanism. Of particular benefit to robotic fabrics, this Pickering emulsion coats individual fabric fibers without filling the space between them when printed onto the fabrics. So you can see confirmation of this in the bottom row of optical backlit images where a neat fabric shows a porosity of about 5% and an inked fabric shows a porosity of about 3%. Compare this to a control conductive composite, which typically fills the fabric and removes any porosity. So this retention of porosity and the neat fiber architecture is particularly well-suited, makes robotic fabrics particularly well-suited to wearable applications where breathability and water vapor transition are important for user comfort. So here's one example where the Pickering emulsion is printed directly onto a fabric. In this case, we use kinesthesiology tape, which is specifically designed to provide support to athletes without restricting their motions. The wearable sensor here is completely breathable and comfortable, and you can see the raw output data from the sensor during movement. And finally, I want to show a demonstration of closed loop control of an actual robotic fabric. So here you can see our Pickering emulsion sensors on cotton fabric, one printed on top and one printed on bottom with our SMA ribbon actuators demonstrating closed loop control. The black line is the set point commanding the fabric to curve up and curve down. And the red and blue lines are the sensors on the top and the bottom respectively. And you can see the fabric motion tracking the set point pretty well. So coming back to our suite of functional fibers, for the purpose of variable stiffness, we developed a particulate composite made from low melting point alloy particles in a thermoset epoxy, which displays a nearly three order of magnitude change in modulus in response to thermal stimulus. So by actively softening and stiffening the variable stiffness fibers, we can regulate the direction and degree of fabric actuation with a higher repeatability and fewer total actuators. An on-demand support structure allows a robotic fabric to perform move and hold operations or hold loads which would otherwise collapse a typical fabric. The variable stiffness material here works by combining the softening of a thermoset polymer when it's warmed above its glass transition temperature with the softening of phase changing particles when they are warmed above their melting temperature. So when the composite is cool, sorry, I'm going to go back to this slide. When the composite is cool and the particles are solid metal, uh, the material should take on more solid metal-like properties. When warm and the particles are melted, the material should be significantly softer because it now contains liquid inclusions rather than solid inclusions. And finally, we can fabricate this, uh, uh, this um, composite fields metal epoxy into fibers by molding it in tubing and then sew those fibers into fabrics. Okay, so we set out to fabricate these low melting point alloy particles, specifically selecting Fields Metal, which is a combination of indium, bismuth, and tin, and has a melting temperature around 62 degrees Celsius. So we were able to adapt our previous method for liquid metal emulsions. Um, and here we simply need to warm the Fields Metal above its melting temperature to make it a liquid metal. When emulsifying the liquid metal E-gain particles, we put bulk liquid metal in a solvent and sonicate, apply a lot of energy and break the bulk material into small particles. Particles. The longer we sonicate for, the smaller the particles. Here, we sonicated Fields Metal in a heated water bath uh, to break the Fields Metal into particles, and then we cooled the suspension while continuing to mix to prevent recoalescence of the particles while solidifying. And in the bottom right, you can see an SEM image of the resulting Fields Metal particles. So mixing the Fields Metal particles into a thermoset epoxy has the desired effect. 
increases the epoxy stiffness when cold due to the solid inclusions, solid metal inclusions, and also decreases the epoxy stiffness when warm due to the field's metal particles melting at 62 degrees Celsius and becoming liquid inclusions. The more field's metal we put in, the more we broaden the stiffness range, but the, with the trade-off of embrittling the material in the cool state. Further, smaller particles introduce more stiffness due to their oxide shells, which increases the composite strength, but decreases its variable stiffness range. And larger particles settle and introduce voids. So all of this taken together, empirically and theoretically, we found that using 50 micron spherical particles at a loading of 46% by volume is ideal for co-optimizing the variable stiffness range and bulk properties of the composite. And putting this into context with other variable stiffness work, we can see that the Fields Metal Epoxy Composite performs pretty well. We compared it to purely melting materials, uh, which perform similarly but need to be enclosed, and also thermoplastics such as ABS and PLA, and to jamming technologies such as particle and layer jamming, and even human muscle. You can see that the stiffness range of the Fields Metal Epoxy outperforms most of these other materials and technologies. Its stiffness ranges from softer than latex rubber in the warm state to about as hard as acrylic in the cool state, which is about a three order of magnitude stiffness range. Okay, so with the actuation sensing and variable stiffness fibers developed, we can now integrate these fibers into robotic fabrics. And we developed three demonstrations. First, we demonstrate a shape-changing robotic fabric. The initial form is flat, and upon activation, the, soft fa the fabric softens its variable stiffness frame and lifts itself up into this table-like platform. We then cool the variable stiffness fibers to make the shape rigid and load-bearing, as demonstrated by the weights being placed on the platform. We then apply current to warm the variable stiffness fibers again, which softens the frame and the shape is able to return to its initial flat configuration using antagonistic ribbon actuators. In the second demonstration, we show a robotic fabric tourniquet. The tourniquet is a breathable fabric sleeve with embedded rows of uh, parallel ribbon actuators, variable stiffness fibers, and the conductive composite in fabric sensors. When the fabric is cut along one of the sensors, the damage is detected as a broken circuit and a compression response is triggered at the damage site. The compression response means that the current is applied to vari the variable stiffness fibers in order to soften them. The fabric compresses using its shape memory alloy ribbon actuators and then stiffens to hold that compressed position without any further power supply. And last, we demonstrate a self-deploying airplane, air, self airplane wings in a fully untethered demonstration. This demonstration was inspired by the 1903 Wright Flyer, which also had fabric wings. The wings in our demonstration are seated into small slits on the side of a 3D printed fuselage where we put all the robot circuitry, microcontrollers, and batteries. So this setup is completely untethered. The fabric wings curl to wrap around the fuselage for compact storage and uncurl into a deployed rigid state with the wings extended. This demonstration shows how robotic fabric can self-stow when not in use and might be useful when a low storage volume is required. And here I'm again excited to share some unpublished work with you all. One of the problems we encountered with our previous robotic fabrics that you saw in all the previous videos is that we could not achieve dynamic motions, primarily because the variable stiffness fibers were passively rigid, allowing the fabric to only become soft when powered, and they were also very slow due to their thermal responsivity, and they required positional actuators, which added hardware bulk to our instantiations. More recently, we designed an electrically driven variable stiffness fiber out of pattern shape memory alloy ribbons that performs a rapid flat to curve geometry trans transition while also self-straightening to provide a rigid load bearing structure when powered, but remaining otherwise flexible. This change to an actively rigid versus passively rigid, fast transitioning and self-straightening variable stiffness fiber enabled this fully untethered locomoting robotic fabric. And finally, I'd like to end this topic on a forward-looking note. We imagine robotic fabrics not just for wearable applications, but also for applications where we can leverage the many technical fabrics that exist. For example, one can imagine fabric robots that act as a parachute to deliver a payload to a course location and then morph into a quadruped using the payload as its body upon landing and further transit into environments inaccessible from the air. So, Following in that uh, forward-looking note, thinking about multi-environment locomotion, I'm now going to switch to the final topic of my talk, um, which looks at multi-environment locomotion using legged robots with morphing limbs.
So this project is motivated by the need for robotic systems that can locomote in drastically different environments. This project is funded by ONR, which has interest in amphibious robots for applications such as eco-monitoring, diver support, and transporting supplies between land and ocean bases. For such multi-environment tasks, a robot would encounter three distinct environments, relatively stable open water, dry land, and the in-between, the surf zone. However, most animals and robots are environment-specific. There are some exceptions, but even amphibious animals tend to perform more efficiently in one environment over the other. Therefore, in considering how to design an efficient multi-environment locomotion robot, we tried to identify land and water animals with morphological similarities. So I'm not showing these two videos by accident. We noticed that sea turtles and land tortoises are morphologically very similar. They both have a central carapace. They are both quadrupeds, but they differ primarily in their limbs. So sea turtles have elongated, flexible flippers evolved for swimming. Tortoises have rounded legs uh, evolved for land locomotion and load bearing. And if we want to create a morphing robot that efficiently locomotes in water and on land, these inspirations isolate where the morphological adaptation would need to occur, just in the limbs. So we built a robot inspired by this idea, and we were really excited that the work was recently published in Nature and featured on the cover. So here is the robot with our morphing limb that can transition from a flipper state optimized for swimming in water to a leg state optimized for walking on land. The morphing limb has four primary components and materials. Flytic actuators that are made from channels embedded in elastomer, variable stiffness material, which is the same thermoset epoxy that was used in the robotic fabrics that I just spoke about, a flexible heater made from laser cut copper, and an anisotropic fibrous composite used to direct the forces of the fluidic actuators. So in this video, uh, we'll show a morphing limb sequence. The limb is neutrally in flipper state. We first apply a current to the embedded copper heater to warm the variable stiffness material, which softens it for morphing. Then we inflate the fluidic actuators to morph the limb from the flat flipper state to a more rounded load-bearing leg state. The foot of the limb folds under for stable contact with the ground. Then we hold the pressure and allow the limb to cool and stiffen and lock in the leg geometry. Finally, we heat the limb again and the stored elastic energy relaxes the limb back to its neutral flipper state. And in here, you can see uh, side views of both the aquatic and terrestrial shapes of the morphing limb and how it interfaces with the rest of the robot body. Each shoulder of the robot contains three motors to form a three degree of freedom kinematic chain and other hardware can be stored protected in the robot shell. We're calling this idea adaptive morphogenesis. It's a design strategy in which adaptive robot morphology and behaviors are realized through unified structural and actuation systems. This is in contrast to the approach of adding a unique propulsive mechanism for each environment to the same robot body, which can result in energy inefficient designs. Adaptive morphogenesis allows a single propulsion mechanism to adapt itself to be used in each environment. And because of the reduced part count, we hypothesize that adaptive morphogenesis may yield efficiency gains in multi-environment locomotion. So let's check out the robot in action. I'll start by showing you some videos of the robot swimming with the limbs in flipper mode. So we tested both lift-based and drag-based propulsion strategies, but here I'm only showing the lift-based gates, lift-based gates because I think they're a bit more beautiful to watch. Um, and these are also really early tests. So the gates are by no means optimized and we're still working on fundamental challenges such as buoyancy control and wireless communication in multiple mediums. But you can get a sense here for the different aquatic maneuvers that we have achieved, including submerged lift, surfacing, and diving. One thing to note is that our robot, while our robot is inspired, inspired by real sea turtle gates, real sea turtles do not have large hind flippers the way our robot does. Sea turtles have large front flippers and really small hind flippers that act primarily as rudders, while our robot has four equally sized flippers, which are needed when the robot is in terrestrial mode. So there are no known aquatic animals right now that have four equally sized flippers like our robot does, but we can take inspiration from the dinosaur era plesiosaur, which had four equally sized flippers. So something that we're working on right now and having a lot of fun with is setting the four flipper swimming method inspired by plesiosaurs to make use of our robot's large hind flippers. And next, we can pull the robot out of the water, morph the limbs from flippers to legs, and have it walk all over campus. So we've tested two gates on land. The first of which you can see here is a quasi-static creeping gate. Um, and, and 
yeah, that's what the robot is using in all of these four videos. So the creeping gate is one of the simplest quadruped gates that can be implemented. And it means that the robot only moves one leg at a time. And there are always three legs in contact with the ground to form a stable tripod. The creeping gate is loosely inspired by the motion of land tortoises. However, our morphing limb does not have a knee joint, so they're not strictly analogous. The most important thing to point out here is that we haven't had success with the creeping gate on non-compact surfaces. So for example, you can see the robot here creeping on a sidewalk and on a rock path. However, this gate did not work on loose sand. The robot is unable to produce forward locomotive forces because it slips in the granular media. So for successful locomotion on loose sand, we employed a second terrestrial gate, a beach crawl gate. In this gate, the limbs of the robot are splayed out and the robot uh, body is in contact with the ground. So crawling is effective over sand because it distributes the robot's weight over a larger area and prevents the legs from slipping. And perhaps we can all see that this is inspiration uh, taken from real sea turtles for the beach crawl gate as, as this is what sea turtles use to crawl up and down the beach. And as a fun fact, this video on the right um, is one that I took myself. I spent a sabbatical working with a sea turtle biologist at Florida Atlantic University studying the amphibious habits of real sea turtles. Um, and so I am the one sitting behind the camera uh, watching this, this beautiful sea turtle enter the ocean. Okay, so now we can put all these shape gate pairs together to achieve a full transition. So as I said before, the robot is not stable using its upright creeping gate on granular substrates. So the first thing that you saw is that the robot just sits down. It then uses its beach crawl gate to locomote into the water. Now, this is an ocean inlet near Yale's campus, um, but it's really calm and relatively controlled for this initial testing. You don't see a lot of wave energy here. Um, so the robot's crawling into the water and eventually it gets deep enough that we're ready to morph its limb into, limbs into flipper mode and assume a swimming gait. Now, when that happens, you'll see that the video actually pauses for a moment. And so you don't actually see the limb morphing sequence. And the reason for that is you might notice while watching this video, we did this testing during the winter in March. Uh, when it spans out again, you can see in the background that there really isn't any greenery um, because of the, the time of year. There's no leaves in the trees and the water was very, very cold. Now you might remember that our variable stiffness material that we're using for morphing is a thermoset epoxy, which is thermally responsive. So we're relying on heating of the limbs in order to morph them between shapes and the water is super cold. Uh, so we were therefore unable to morph the limbs underwater due to the coupling to the environment, which is why you saw that pause. We actually had to take the robot out of the water, morph the limbs in air, and then put it back in in order to assume the swimming gait. So there are a couple of solutions to this. The first is to go back when it's warmer. Um, so we took the robot back to the same exact spot during the summer. Here you can see the greenery, people are canoeing in the background, and we deploy the same transition. So you saw the robot standing up, it sits down, it crawls into the water. We found that the energetics of morphing underwater were still very unfavorable. So we developed this strategy of lifting the limbs out of the water to morph them in the air before putting them back in and crawling a bit more with the limbs in flipper mode and then switching to a swimming gait. Um, so now we can look at cost of transport in the respective environments, and then I'll come back to how we are further mitigating this environmental temperature coupling issue. Um, so, so here are the the robot, um, the Yale Amphibious Robotic Turtle, or ART for short, uh, is highlighted here. It has a minimum cost of transport of three for aquatic locomotion and 10 for terrestrial locomotion. Uh, note that the robot mass increases for submerged swimming because we incorporated the ballast. So ART situates itself among other animals and robots well, outperforming some state-of-the-art unimodal terrestrial and aquatic robots. ART outperforms some terrestrial legged robots such as the MIT learning biped by three times and performs similarly to unimodal tethered quadrupeds such as cheetah cub and titan. ART also outperforms many aquatic robots including a robotic jellyfish by 10 times and a tuna bot by two times. But it's really important to note that we were not trying to show that ART's cost of transport in a given environment was better than robots specialized for that environment, but rather that ART's cost of transport was on par with specialized robots in multiple environments. So this is the newest version of our robot. And, and coming back to the environmental coupling issue, we needed to uh, change out our variable stiffness material and make it not thermally responsive. So this is the jamming amphibious robotic turtle, or JART for short. 
Dart has new limbs that leverage a topologically augmented laminar jamming material for variable stiffness, and it allows the limbs to morph between flipper and leg configurations in seconds, very, very fast, which even allows the stiffness changes to happen mid-gait cycle for potential efficiency gains, and that's something that we're working on right now. Uh, Jart uses Kirigami-inspired cuts in the limbs to amplify the limb stiffness range, making limb morphing easier, and it does this independent of temperature because we're now using a pressure-responsive material rather than a thermally responsive material. So here you can see Jart employing a library of shape gate stiffness policies that are implemented during walking. So you can see that the robot's limbs are now able to use the upright creeping gate on granular substrates. That's in the upper left corner, which is an improvement from the prior version. You can also see the robot swimming using a drag bag-based paddling gait. It's also crawling on several different substrates with its limbs both stiffened and softened. Uh, and that's something that we're looking at to evaluate cost of transport in different environments based on stiffness. And we see it doing a full transition, traveling from land to water and back again, a full transition that we were previously unable to achieve with the prior version of the robot. So in summary, the new robot design solves a host of challenges that we encountered with the first robot design, which allows the new robot to walk upright on less stable substrates, make full environmental transitions, and operate independent of the environment temperature. However, while the new limb boasts more favorable terrestrial locomotion, we do see hydrodynamic efficiency losses. These limbs are a little bulkier. So we're continually working to optimize the morphing limb design for efficiency in water, on land, and in transitional environments. I'll note here again that none of the aquatic or terrestrial gates I've shown are fully optimized, but hopefully you can see the potential that this platform may have in not just achieving aquatic and terrestrial locomotion, but as a means for studying the transition. We can now leverage this platform to ask questions like, how and when should a robot change its gait and shape when transitioning from one environment to another? Okay, so I am going to wrap up here. Um, in conclusion, my group is developing particulate and fibrous composites for next generation robots that will allow them to adapt their morphology, properties, and behavioral control policies to changing tasks and environments. And in this talk, I described several of these materials and their translation into several shape-changing robot platforms for this adaptive morphology policies um, and, and, uh, and properties as they adapt to changing tasks and environments. So I'd like to thank my students and, and postdocs for the amazing work they do. Of course, uh, they, you know, all the work I've shown here um, is, is piloted by them. I also want to thank my funding sources for financial support and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. Um, we really appreciate that wonderful talk. Uh, very, very interesting work across many, many disciplines. And so uh, I'm going to switch back to introduce our panelists, and then we will continue from there. So um, let me show this. So our, our first panelist is uh, Dr. Lavi Tutika from Virginia Tech. Uh, uh, Lavi is a research scientist in the mechanical engineering department. He got his PhD from Iowa State in the MSc department in 2020, and his work is at the intersection of soft and multifunctional composite bio-inspired materials and additive manufacturing. He exploits the, um, the fascinating interplay between materials composition microstructure and programming functional responses to create soft materials with unconventional healing and configurable electronics. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Josh Bogard, and uh, Josh is a, a professor in computer science at the University of Vermont. Josh is very well, um, has a, a quite a number of awards, I'm not gonna go through all of them. Uh, uh, he runs the Morphology Evolution and Cognition uh, Laboratory, where he creates AI robots and uh, computer design, uh, design organisms, so-called xenobots. His awards range from the uh, Presidential Career Award, um, the MIT Technology Review's Top 35 Under 35, uh, Cosarelli Prize for the National Academies, among many others. He has also been, uh, he's, he's co-authored a book, um, uh, sorry, he's, he's authored a book, not co-authored. And he has appeared on CNN um, and his work has been covered by New York Times, BBC, among many others. 
Uh, <clears throat> our next uh, panelist is our challenger, Bo Yuan from Tsinghua University. Uh, Bo is a, a postdoc in Professor Jing Liu's lab, and those of us in Liquid Metal, Jing is not new to the to the field; is very well known in the in the area. Uh, uh, she is in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and the School of Medicine. Her research interest mainly focuses on the surface or interface behavior of room temperature liquid metal materials and design of liquid metal based composite materials, as well as development of intelligent equipment. And with that, I'm going to ask uh, all of us to join the panel. And uh, to begin our QA, let's ask our challenger to ask our speaker uh, questions. Thank you, Martin. And thank you. Rebecca, thanks for your very interesting and inspiring talk, which shows us clearly brilliant, brilliant ideas and inspiring by the creators. Uh, as I as mentioned before, I'm a, a postdoc, which uh, my research interest is mainly focused on liquid metal. So uh, maybe uh, there, uh, there are several varying questions that I want to ask you about. I summarized due to the time, maybe two questions. Uh, this first one is about the, uh, you know, the uh, the robotic turtle. Yeah, I'm very interested in it. Uh, however, as you mentioned that it, uh, the thermal, you know, the first stiffness regulation is mainly focused on this, uh, is mainly depends on the thermal regulation. However, uh, along with the time, it would, uh, be affected by the uh, environment. Um, second, you say the newest version is about uh, using the uh, pressure uh, pressure regulation. However, uh, both of the uh, regulation we say the turtle behind the turtle there is a very long line like the long tie long tail. Meaning it uh, still needs to depend on other uh, other regulation method or devices from the uh, yeah, uh, I, as I say, maybe the creatures, you know, they are self-powered, uh, mainly from the chemical energy or something. Uh, have you any, uh, do you have any ideas that can change it? Yeah, like using some self-powered materials or... Yeah, yes. that's my question. Thank, thank you for your question. Yeah, um, you're right. It has a very long tail. <laughs> uh, the robot, the robot is tethered. So, um, especially in the the videos of the original version, the version one of the robot, um, the tether is to a generator. So, for both power supply and um, communication with with a laptop that's that we're using for control. Um, in switching to, so this is one of the challenges. You know, we we switched from a thermally responsive variable stiffness material to a pressure responsive variable stiffness material. We already had some pressure responsivity because we had um, pneumatic actuators that are driving the morphing. Um, and now we're using jamming to, to stiffen and soften the limb. Um, so it's, a, it's, as many might know, it's much more difficult to untether a system with all of these airflow considerations um, where we're using, we need to have reservoirs of air and compressed air um, versus just being able to electrically stimulate, you know, a joule heater uh, for thermally responsive materials. Um, but decoupling from the environment, temperature was something that we decided to prioritize. Um, and we are still working to untether the robot. So our newest iteration, um, so the the unpublished version that I just presented is under review. And then, of course, we have the next generation that we're currently working on. Um, and, and untethering is a priority for this next generation. Um, so we do have compressed air supply on board. Um, obviously, we'll have you know limited time, limited number of morphing transitions the robot can accomplish because of a quantity of air on board. Um, but we're also you know, putting um, computation, communication, everything on board as well and, and untethering the system as much as possible. So it's a challenge that we're working towards and there are benefits and drawbacks to all different approaches. Um, but but we did decide to, to rely on these jamming and pneumatic actuation technologies versus thermally responsive materials just for the environmental temperature coupling issue. 
forward to see your newest version of the robotics. Yeah, my next question is about the robotic fab fabrics. Yeah, the fabrics. Um, I say that it can change in shape and it can uh, it's some somehow like it has a continuous stiffness variable uh, ability, right? Yeah. Uh, however, I was wondering when it uh, uh, in your diagram you say it's in the water or in the air or flying in the sky. Uh, I was wondering when it can can contact with other you know the medium such as the uh, air is uh, is very uh, common. But how, how about when it um, immersing into the water or contact with other you know some other other materials which has um, a very as you mentioned before the thermal pro pro yeah. property has very large and how to use solve the stability of the yeah you're absolutely right so all of our um actuation and variable stiffness technologies that we're using in the robotic fabrics right now are thermally responsive so we use the shape memory alloy ribbons for actuation thermally responsive material. Um, and in the first version of the robotic fabrics that I presented, we used the uh, Fields Metal Epoxy Composite, thermally responsive, relies on phase change and glass transition temperatures for adjusting the, the stiffness. Um, in the newer version that is under review, we have um, the variable stiffness shape memory alloy variable stiffness fibers. So, you know, these rely on uh, these these shape memory alloy ribbons, which have been patterned in order to, and, and programmed when heated, they remember a self-straightened position and also a curved position, this kind of half pipe that gives it geometric um, stiffness. Also thermally responsive though. So, so absolutely coupling to the environment will be an issue, right? If it's warmer out or colder out, um, you know, even just airflow um, or submerged, uh, we found that to be a huge issue with morphing our thermally responsive limbs underwater with the, the turtle system. Um, and so I would expect that to be, you know, a challenge as well um, for the robotic fabrics. And, you know, also with the robotic fabrics, we're concerned about wearability. You know, wearables is one of our primary applications and shape memory alloys in contact with the skin. Um, it would be uncomfortable. We would have to do some kind of thermal shielding there. So I think the challenge that you bring up is incredibly valid. Um, and it's one that we haven't mitigated yet. Um, so right now we're, we're focusing on challenges associated with attaining dynamic motion, um, moving away from quasi-static motions towards fully dynamic motions. Um, uh, and also you know, thinking about um, how to, to untether the system and have it carry around its own own power supply, which is what you saw um, in the locomotion dynamic video. Uh, but we haven't begun to start thinking about replacing all of our functional fibers with non-thermally responsive ones, which is honestly something that probably, um, you know, for, for practical implementation in the future is probably something that we will need to do. Thank you very much. V very good. Uh Maybe we can ask the, uh, another panelist to jump in with questions. Ravika. Yeah, I can jump in. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, Rebecca, beautiful talk, um, very aspiring. And um, I mean, I with the turtle bots, it almost looked like Boston Dynamics a couple of decades ago. I hope uh, these soft robots will, you know, grow towards like next generations and um, kind of implement the latest technologies, how Boston Dynamics does it, um, and kind of update it to um, become the uh, soft robotic counterpart to the, uh, you know, ever ever becoming powerful Boston Dynamics robot. Um, so in light of that, how, um, how can soft robotics in general kind of impact uh, the society and like where would the field go in the next um, let's say five to ten years and um, what kind of role does haptics or research in like material intelligence have um, in kind of forwarding the field of soft robotics? That's a broad question. <laughs> um, yeah so the, the future of soft robotics um, you know I, I believe I, I don't believe that all robots in the future will be completely soft. Um, I, but I do believe that robots can benefit from the inclusion of soft robotic technologies. 
Um, and that's where we've started to kind of get at with the the turtle and tortoise inspired system where only the limbs are are the soft robotic component and then we use the the central structure as a more traditional robot design. Um, and there are other really interesting works coming out that show that things like just using variable stiffness on the pads of robot feet, um, you know, that the part that's in contact in the ground with the ground can can show real efficiency gains, you know, something that's relatively simple um, to to modulate mid-gait cycle in a locomotion robot, for example, can show real decreases in cost of transport. And so I think these soft robotic technologies are starting to be adopted more and more by, you know, traditional robots. And I, I see a real melding of these fields. There's not such a distinguishing line between more traditional robots and soft robots. I think that they're melding, and that's honestly the the direction um, for the soft robotics field is is the true integration um, into more traditional robot platforms, um, which will further be expanded by AI. Um, so this is something that um, for a long time I've been been working with Josh on um, is incorporating evolutionary algorithms and having the robot, you know, find for itself, you know, given a new encountering a new environment, what shape and gait should I now um, use in order to be most efficient in this environment? And so all of these things kind of coming together, these huge advancements in AI, these huge advancements in soft robotic technologies and more traditional robotic technologies merging, um, I think that this is going to show the real promise for the field where uh, the end goal, I believe, is, is adaptation on the fly. Rebecca, if, if I can jump on, on, on one aspect that uh, Ravi mentioned, you know, with the work going on in the uh, Ripomi's lab, uh, Rolly Kaiser's lab in Delaware, and Dog's lab in Delaware on haptics, uh, do you think that soft robots have, has a, an upper hand in terms of applying haptics to sense the environment, to become more adaptive, to feed into the AI and machine learning, and therefore making them much faster in morphing to the adapting to the environment a way that uh, rigid robots cannot. If they can, for example, if your turtle can, for example, sense, I am now dealing with grains of sand, mm -hmm. versus I'm dealing with a, a very locky situation, will they be better at adapting to that because then they can control the pressure profile on the limbs, giving them better grip, something that a rigid robot cannot. Is there, is there room there to invite people in the haptics world to start thinking about soft robots and bring in people like Josh to work with the people in haptics to say, hey, we need to read this signal and integrate it to the machine and then feed that to someone like you who's in the soft robots to build a super robot that can be completely autonomous and we get rid of the tethers. Is it even possible or am I dreaming? No, I think I... I I think it's completely possible. And I so to be clear, I'm not um my my group hasn't traditionally focused on haptics. Um and so I don't want to present myself as an expert in this area. Um but just generally speaking about well, when I think of haptics, I often I often think about wearable applications. Um and I also, you know, I recognize like force feedback into the robot and adaptation. I think sensing the environment and reacting to it is absolutely an application space for for soft robots. Um, the conformability to the environment, that interface with the environment, soft materials, that's why we have soft finger pads, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, so that it, it's a it's a relatively simple approach, um, but of course, you know, having the sensitivity that we've previously attained from rigid counterparts and merging that and you know incorporating that into just the soft material um, is is a challenge that I think many are are working on. Like I said, my group has not historically uh, focused on that particular challenge, um, but I know that many people are making incredible strides in that area. Thank you. One of the purpose of the forum is to invite non-participants into this field. That's why I didn't want that to slide by because people in haptics should be looking in soft robotics as a pathway. Thank you. Lavi, sorry for taking your time. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I think I think that's good. Um, I guess my next question, Rebecca, is about um, 
like hybrid electronics, you showed this beautiful soft Arduino um, that you integrated with the uh, Robert, and uh, that's that's awesome in terms of like all these demonstrations of LEDs with uh, a co couple of liquid metal lines. So uh, it's it's really like the next level um, in terms of um, soft electronics. But I think um, one of the things that's currently very limited right now is um, the reliability of these soft devices um, or soft electronics um, compared to like the standards or um, reliability tests in rigid electronics field or uh, semiconductor uh, technologies. Uh, what is your perspective on um, some tests that we should, I guess, design or um, standardize in the field so that everyone can align to that and then strive towards um, those kind of metrics for soft electronics? Yeah, the question is, what kind of success metrics should we be <laughs> focusing on for stretchable electronics? Uh, that's a fantastic question. And honestly, I think it's something I, I don't want to unilaterally answer this. I think it's something that we need to develop as a community um, and put forward as, as a community together. The challenges in stretchable electronics are plentiful, right? <laughs> as, as, as I think you are also very aware. Um, you know, interfacing soft to rigid is difficult. We still rely for, you know, logic gate density. We still rely on um, integrated circuits, on microcontrollers and, um, you know, off-the-shelf components that we need to interface with our system. Um, so the soft Arduino that you saw, you know, it, it had a microcontroller in there. It had, you know, resistors and, and other off-the-shelf components integrated. Um, and so, yeah, this is, you know, the typical failure point is the interfaces between the liquid materials, the soft materials, and the strain-limited materials. Uh, so that's, that's an open challenge. Um, something else that we struggle with is just uh, substrate compatibility um, so we're looking at material tackiness and, uh, you know, that's part of the reason that B-gain, this class of biphasic gallium indiums, um, has been particularly attractive to us because it, um, it seems to just stick well <laughs> to a lot of substrates more so than neat E-gain has traditionally for us in the past. But it's still a primary concern um, where we see, you know, traces will, will, lose signal sometimes and lose conductivity just from uh, poor conformability and poor contact with the substrate. Um, so how to formalize these into evaluation metrics? Uh, I mean, I, can, I, can I deflect the question back to you? <laughs> um, can we openly discuss the challenges associated <laughs> with stretchable electronics and try to come up with a series of evaluation tests and metrics that we should be putting in every paper? <laughs> Yeah, I I think I think that's what uh, that's what as a community we should do in terms of um, I I guess defining life cycle of of a soft yeah. electronic device like how do you assess it and um, and you know in terms of like contacts um, rigid electronics have very specific tests and the different temperature cycles um, and I think Nextflex. Um, is Nextflex Technologies. They're doing a pretty good job in trying to uh, define some tests, but they're like very, very skewed uh, <laughs> and very basic. So I, I think as a community, that's a good point uh, to include um, at conferences or generally in the in the papers uh, in the future. Yeah, actually, I think, I think you answered that question much better than I did. So, um, you know, things that we normally include when we're reporting things in our stretchable electronics literature, you know, obviously just conductivity, but the electromechanical behavior, but then that is also the electromechanical behavior sometimes dependent on strain rate and you know, maximum strain. Um, environmental sensitivities is one you just mentioned. Cyclic stability, again, which I think can be dependent on strain rate and the maximum strain being used. So it gets very muddled, right? You can report that the system is reliable over hundreds of thousands of strain cycles, but maybe that's only straining to 20% versus you know, if you were yeah. to strain the device to a thousand percent, you might get a very different cyclic stability. Yeah. Um, so I agree. I, I think that uh, we, as a community, um, 
should set some very strict standards for reporting so that we can better compare our technologies to one another. Yep, thank you. Um, I'll end with one fun question, I guess. Um, for the soft Arduino, how many uh, how many of those devices did your students make uh, to to get the final demo done? <laughs> Oh, the, yeah. So my student leading this work is Stephanie Woodman, um, and she made many. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but there were many, many, many stretchable Arduinos covering the bench top for a long time. Uh, thank you. Very good. Josh? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, Rebecca, great talk. And um as uh, Martin mentioned, Rebecca and I have worked together for many years, so I, I am honored to be her colleague and, and her student. I have learned a lot about bio-inspired uh, robotics. Um, I, I just, um, before I ask any questions, just to maybe provide some more background context on some of the work that Rebecca just showed. I, I know there's a lot of students here on the call, and as Rebecca mentioned, a lot of her work is forward-facing, thinking about what the future potential is for these machines, devices and approaches. So I, I think it's a great time to be a student getting into robotics and AI and, and the design of intelligent machines in general. Um, I think a lot of folks have felt that um, with the invention of chat GPT and some of the other things happening in AI, it, it sometimes can feel like the, the important problems have been solved and all that remains is to sort of incrementally improve the technology. But I think this is my personal view at the moment. A lot of that hype has started to die down a little bit now, and people have started to recognize the limitations of what is often called non-embodied AI, computer programs running inside a computer that don't have flexible bodies like the ones that Rebecca was just showing. So my view, having worked in the field of robotics and AI for 25 years now, is that we're, we're not at the end, we're really just at the beginning. So I, I would invite all the students and young folks on the call today to, to uh, absorb all that Rebecca just showed you and to realize that it's really just the beginning of what's possible. And hopefully many of you will, will join the adventure of creating intelligent machines. Um, so, so the question is, what direction to go in? Well, where can we go with these kinds of technologies? And this is something that my group has sort of worked on for a long time, trying to think through what does it mean for an intelligent machine or an organism to have a body? What, what role does... What role does or can the body play in allowing that organism or that machine to operate intelligently and survive and thrive in the in the real world? And, and Rebecca already showed you some concrete examples this morning. Um, one of the things I think that Rebecca's group has made really clear is it's not only important to have a body, but it's important to have a flexible body to be able to change your interface with the world. And as, as a human being, it's not always obvious, but that's something that we have all enjoyed. We have all grown up from very small children, literally small into large, more or less six foot adults. And along the way, our bodies have experienced massive changes. And throughout that process, we have been able to learn and retain and add new skills and change how we do things. And I would say that that ability to be physically flexible is a foundation that we use to become mentally flexible. So generally speaking, this is something that, that I've been trying to articulate, my group has been trying to articulate for many years. And for those that are interested in it, um, Martin already mentioned, uh, I published a book together with Rolf Pfeiffer on this topic. And the title of the book is How the Body Shapes the Way We Think. So what is it about being physically flexible, you know, that helps a machine or an organism to become mentally flexible? Well, one obvious example is when we were all young and we interacted with the world around us, we learned very quickly that there's many different ways 
to solve a problem. Um, Rebecca's tortoise was was one example, her, her fabric robots. As you just saw in the many videos that Rebecca just showed, many of her robots are able to do the same task, but in different ways. I have a, a very young son at home, and he's in the process of learning how to pick up objects and manipulate things and walk around. And he's you can see he's learning that there's more than one way to solve a problem. And that's obviously a very powerful lesson as we move through life and start to tackle non-embodied, non-physical intellectual tasks. Part of the reason why we're all here is we're all interested in how to do things differently. And so I think there's so much we can learn from looking at the natural world, as Rebecca just showed you, and learn about how plants and animals change and adapt change their bodies, which changes the ways they can interact with the environment. And for some of that organisms, like human beings, we use that as a platform for learning how to be mentally flexible and add and learn new skills that clearly Mother Nature never prepared us for or our ancestors for. So I just wanted to throw that out as sort of one example of a, of a way to think into the future about how these machines that Rebecca and some of her colleagues are building that are changing the way we think about intelligence in general, regardless of whether we're talking about a machines and organisms. There are other ways to try and create intelligent machines other than chat GPT. And we'll see in the long run what, what actually wins, what actually brings us into the age of truly intelligent, flexible, useful, safe machines. Uh, I realize I'm biased. There's a reason why I work with, with Rebecca. I think she's on the right track. I think physically flexible machines are going to become in the future intellectually and mentally flexible machines as well. Thank you. Well, actually, Josh, I couldn't agree with you more. Maybe Rebecca, please slide in uh, the, the differentiation in this, uh, in this following Lavi's question about standardization. Maybe we need to start putting in differentiating physical flexibility with intellectual flexibility. Because I really like that idea that gets lost in, when we think about soft robots, we always think about the physical flexibility, but we never really think about the underlying intelligence of, for example, the morphing modes in your robots. It's not just a soft robot. It is also intellectually soft. It's moldable, it's adaptive. Uh, and, and, and I really like that. And actually, on, on that note, I'm going to throw out uh, another futuristic uh, idea. Now that you've made uh, an onboard flexible uh, Arduino, can we start thinking about data processing on board the robot? Can we start thinking about edge computing such that we embed sensors and we start building these um, systems that can actually filter out irrelevant data to make the, 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 the robot process the information it's getting. For example, looking at, at your turtle swimming, that is a very nice pathway to doing water quality assessment, especially in the summer, in, in, in the beach and all that. You can send it out there, and if nothing toxic is available, it doesn't need to transmit the data. And then it can just filter that data out and send only alarms when things are going south. Can we think, or is there a pathway to building soft edge computing system? Can we start thinking about neuromorphic computing so that we can save on power? What are the material requirements? Can we actually use soft matter to do that? Is it possible? Or might, uh, is it too futuristic, it's too far away to, to even think about that? I don't think it is. I think, um, I mean, there's been such amazing literature coming out about neuromorphic computing and edge computing, right? These, these fields that you're referring to and their confluence with soft robotic technologies and how we can start to use, you know, I, I think there's been some beautiful works on mechanical computing as well and how that interfaces with neuromorphic computing. Um, so I believe there's huge opportunities at in, in these spaces and at these disciplinary boundaries. Um, you know, just to speak to the the more immediate future, um, as you noted, now that we have this soft Arduino, now that we have a fully, you know, fully soft, I say fully soft computer, but it does have a microcontroller on there. So, um, you know, there's IC components <laughs> integrated within it still. Uh, and that's what gives us, you know, the, the same Arduino 
you know, computing density that we're used to. Uh, it's just the exact form, but now soft and stretchable, mostly soft and stretchable. Uh, but now that we have that ability, you know, our next step is to build many robots all with onboard single board computers. And we can start looking at, you know, emergent behaviors, collective behaviors, um, where the robots can communicate with one another. We can start tapping into, you know, swarm algorithms that have traditionally only been applied to rigid systems, where each one has to have an ability to communicate with its neighbor. And now we can build that ability into a soft swarm and what could be the advantages of soft swarms and soft collective, uh, you know, robot systems. Um, I think that that question is something that I'm very interested in that we honestly haven't answered. You know, can there, can we achieve emergent functions through the inclusion that are only accessible using soft and elastic collisions that are inaccessible using, um, you know, rigid swarms? I, I'm not sure yet. We haven't identified exactly what those emergent functions might be, but it's something that we're thinking about. Okay. Josh? Yeah, it's a great question, Martin. I just wanted to, to add to that thread. Um, Rebecca and I have some recent work on exactly this. She mentioned mechanical computers. When you, move, when you move computation into some of these soft materials that Rebecca's group is working on, you can not only move the computation on board, but the very form of the computation itself can change. Mm -hmm. And we don't have time to go into the details, but uh, I'll just say that the way that some of the way that we've been able to get some of Rebecca's materials and robots to compute doesn't look anything like computation in a traditional computer. Yeah. And that in turn is challenging some of our biology colleagues to go back and look at organisms and biological brains and ask new questions about how organisms compute and brains compute and maybe we had it wrong all along maybe there were things we weren't looking for so again i think working with physical materials you know it's not just redoing everything that's been done in traditional rigid robotics or traditional ai those new materials force us to think differently and think more broadly about how intelligence can be instantiated in machines and again i think we're just at the beginning of that yeah, uh, actually, I'm very happy that you brought that up because the, you, you kind of read into where I was going with this. Because I see opportunity when I uh, I see Rebecca's work and and, and the, the the others that are working in this field. I see a rewriting of what we think is a norm, and and, and actually uh, it lines very well with uh, something I, I I came across from uh, Professor uh, Sanker at Stanford uh, in his discussion about Posimos devices beyond Moore's law, he points out uh, in his calculation, he points out that the future of electronics is not hard. It's actually soft and it's self-assembled. So when I look at these materials, I, I'm asking myself, could we start pushing that now? Because we have a, a, a use case that could rely on self-assembled elect functional electronic components that will integrate perfectly with these devices and change the way we are thinking about making processes. Uh, the, the, the other thing is talking about interfaces, like interface-based devices. It's already uh, predicted that uh, one of the most efficient transistors we can make is creating the interface between two 2D materials, two graphene sheets. A BISFET is more efficient than anything we have right now. And as we think about that beyond CMOS and beyond Moore's law, electronics, do we have a platform where we can start exercising that future and opening pathways to colleagues and to industries that are deeply entrenched in a history? Because you know, getting into micro microelectronics, trying to change that field, nobody wants to lose the multi-million dollars they have invested in their processes. But we could we cut a niche on the soft matter? Could we cut something out? That is a hybrid between what we know, the metal, uh, the, the metal oxide uh, conductors, soft organics, and create whole new computational capability. And I see this as a very good op uh, opportunity. So, Josh, thank you so much for, for that comment. But I welcome any comments from the audience uh, uh, because we are all experts here in this uh, soft area. Could we do something like that? Lavi? 
Yeah. Um, I, I mean, actually, I was looking at this paper from uh, Rebecca's group, probably Josh, Josh was also part of it. Um, I think it's the polycomputing with the uh, granular media. I think that's if we could integrate some sort of material logic into the soft robotic platforms, and that would be the hybrid that where we would start um, doing material level logic and using that um, to build sort of like electronics all along the uh, peripherals of the soft robot. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's where um, I would see like most of the people getting excited. You, you mentioned, Martin, you mentioned electronics. You know, do we need to compute with electrons at all? You know, what, what we can compute with vibration. We can compute with light. You know, there's, there's so many opportunities. And I think, again, trying to, trying to break down the walls of our assumptions about how things have to be done. Um, I'd mention a couple more of Rebecca's and my colleagues. Um, Hod Lipson at uh, Columbia and Rob Shepard at uh, Cornell, Th they have done some work to show that these distinctions between electronics, motors, sensors, batteries, those distinctions might not necessarily hold up as we move further into soft robotics and more exotic materials that, again, those are just arbitrary distinctions that, you know, engineers have made in the past because they were limited by materials. But there's no reason why those different parts of an intelligent machine or organism need to be even separate things. Um, and again, I think we're really just at the beginning of that. There's so much more to explore. That's very a very true statement, Josh. Yeah. yeah. That, that's very good. Any, any other comment? Any other question to our speaker? question sure. yeah maybe from a junior researcher aspect degree you know rebecca i have been following up your researches for a very long time and i noticed that from the very beginning you may more focus on the materials including their basic properties performance um, and maybe design but generally you uh, turn to the uh, you know the uh, the mature de devices you know the soft robotic systems I know I, it is very difficult to uh, turn some scientific things into industrial things. Yeah, but you did this successfully. <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, is there anything that you can share with us? To, uh, what caused this transformation in your research focus? Is there any significant uh, experiences you may would like to share with our junior researchers? Uh, that is the most important in this process. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so you're right. Uh, my PhD largely focused on, you know, fundamental properties of yeah. liquid metals. And then as I continued my uh, academic career, I branched out more into soft robotics and applications. Um, and, but we had this really consistent, you know, I, I showed in this kind of, um, this home slide in my talk, we have a very consistent pipeline between materials and robots. And so, you know, if you dig back into the literature, um, for every robot that we have, there's some enabling material technology that came first. You know, so we publish a paper, you know, here's some new material concept, um, you know, uh, some new responsivity or new behavior, and then we port that into a soft robot platform to try to show how the new behavior can expand the behaviors of robots and the functions of robots, um, and I, I think this just stems from my my general interest in in application. Um, you know, I, I've always I've loved. I get well. I'm excited about a lot of things, and I get distracted. <laughs> but I I love the the fundamental science. I love uh, at but then also you know seeing how it can actually be instantiated in a real system and how that can attain a, a new a new functionality, a new behavior. I also think a lot of the work comes from identifying the limitations of current hardware systems to say, you know, man, we want to achieve this thing or we want to study this problem, but we don't have a hardware system that we can use to test it. Um, you know, how do we build that? Okay, that usually comes for us, that usually comes back to the materials to say, if we want to achieve a system that can do this thing so we can test this hypothesis, 
we first need to build a material that we can put into the hardware platform in order to do that. Um, so this is how we we kind of got to this pipeline. Um, and I, I think it, I think there are there are many that that do this very successfully a, as well. And so um, I guess I, I if there's an advice for junior researchers out there, I would say whichever side you're on, if you're more interested in robots or more interested in materials, I think it's always possible to to move between the two. Very good. Now, in, in the interest of uh, time, allow me to move us along. Um, let's see. So <clears throat> I want to thank everyone for such a, um, a very forward-looking, future-looking um, discussion. And Rebecca, thank you so much for uh, triggering a very wonderful discussion and sharing your wonderful work. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, you coming in and kicking off the Liquid Meta series um, here on ICANX. And thank you for being our speaker. And uh, as is customary, uh, we if this was live, Alice and I would have walked and presented this certificate to you, but now please accept it virtually. We, uh, we want to appreciate you uh, uh, being our speaker for the 150 volt volume. Thank you and so with much. That, yep, you're welcome. Uh, I also want to remind everyone, next week we're going to highlight research in the Oceania. This is the Australia, New Zealand, uh, and other island countries. Uh, it will be hosted by uh, uh, Lan Fu uh, from Australian National University. And please uh, join us next Friday uh, to hear this about this uh, fantastic uh, development in the Oceania. And with that, I want to say thank you to everyone and a wonderful day. Thank you. Wow. Great. I'm a mental flat spell.不再是奇迹，不再是幻想，此刻正感觉全世界离我鼓掌。不必太在意身旁惊奇的目光，可以点点头，可以放声歌唱。我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞。再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can， 你也能够像我一样飞越最高山岗。I can, I can。可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can， 你也能够像我一样飞越最高山岗奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞，不再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, 